Hello everyone, my name is Trevor Cully, and if you'll indulge me jumping ahead in the story for a little bit, I have a few spoilers about Timur. We'll eventually see that he conquered a huge swath of territory in and around modern Iran, historically called Persia, and we'll see that Timur's empire adopted many things about Persian language and culture. Of course, the history of Persian empires goes back way further than Timur, and that's where I come in. I'm the host of the History of Persia podcast, where I am telling the story of ancient Persia from the foundation of the first Persian Empire by Cyrus the Great and the Achaemenid dynasty, and slowly working my way towards the rise of Islam and the end of the ancient world. These are the empires that connected the world from ancient Greece and Rome all the way to India and China. If those stories and the cultures that surround them sound interesting to you, you can find the History of Persia at historyofpersiapodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, like this one. Hello and welcome to the Timur Podcast, a podcast that covers the conquests, character, and legacy of the man Timur the Lame, or Tamerlane as he's sometimes called. A 14th century conqueror who emerged from Central Asia and carved himself an empire stretching from India to Anatolia, from Russia to Arabia. We are back. After weeks or months or years or however long it's been, we're finally back to the story of this fascinating man. So thank you for hanging in there with me and for your ongoing support. It really does mean a lot. I hope you're staying safe and staying well. I am slowly getting to a better place in my life, slowly but surely. So that's good. We'll leave it at that, though, and uh, we'll get into things. But first of all, of course, you did hear from Trevor Cully from the History of Persia podcast at the beginning of this show. Just want to give a quick shout out, shout out to him. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Have you ever listened to a podcast where... The host is compelling, the material is great, but you just, you get that feeling that he's a real jerk in real life, kind of like when you're listening to this podcast. Okay, with that said, I can assure you that that is not the case with Trevor and the History of Persia podcast. I know this is weird, but I have to say it because before I actually made this podcast and I was just kind of poking my head around online, seeing if there was any interest in a show on, on Timmer. Trevor was one of, he's probably the third person to reach out to me and offer me support and encouragement and told me, make this show. Uh, and then he gave me all sorts of resources and uh, just really helped me get in the mindset of, yeah, I, could, I can actually do this. So Trevor is a good guy behind, behind the scenes of podcasting. I think. I don't know him personally, so maybe he's robbing banks or something. Again, that wouldn't really surprise me, but I think he's a good guy. So you can listen to the History of Persia podcast. It's a great podcast. The research is phenomenal. Um, he's a great storyteller, and he's probably a good guy. So now that I have alienated my friendship with Trevor, let's move on to the Timmer podcast. Uh, and speaking of, this past month or so, we've had quite a few new listeners join us. And if you are a new listener, welcome we're glad you're here. You've picked a great time to jump on board because, my friend, we are here. Timmer is here on the scene. We finally finished those long episodes of Pretext, and Timmer has been born. Now, I had, surprisingly, several new listeners reach out and say that they binge listened to every episode in, like, two days. You're crazy if you did that. But for me, and for the rest of us normal people, it's been quite a while since we last talked. So we're going to start this episode with a short... And I promise it will be short, but a short summary of what we've covered this far, because you know that I love summaries. Anyway, here we go. So, a long time ago, there was this guy named Genghis Khan. You may have heard of him. He's sort of a big deal. Genghis Khan created and then expanded the Mongolian Empire. Then he died, and incredibly, his empire survived past his death. It passed on to his son, Ogadai Khan, who ruled for a while, then to his son, Guyuk Khan, and then to the fourth great Khan, Monk Khan. When Monk Khan died in the year 1259 CE, the Mongol Empire perished as a united political entity. 
and the four governing parts that made up the empire each split off and became their own autonomous factions, and we typically call these four parts the four Khanates. There was the Yuan Dynasty, that is the first Khanate, which controlled much of what is today modern Mongolia, Korea, parts of Indonesia and Vietnam at times, and of course its heartland eastern China. The second of these Khanates, and th this is in no particular order, but the Golden Horde, which is the best named Khanate, covered much of what is today the Ukraine, western and southern Russia, parts of Kazakhstan and parts of eastern Europe. Oh, by the way, the Golden Horde, <laughs> it's named after the Golden Tents that most of the Golden Horde leaders lived in, which is a neat detail and one that I left out in the episode on the Golden Horde. So we'll... Just, we'll just move on. Anyway, the third Khanate, the Ilkhanate, covered much of the Middle East, Persia, Mesopotamia, Eastern Anatolia, the Caucasus, etc. And finally, wedged in between these three other Khanates, the Chagatai Khanate controlled much, much of Central Asia, places like Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Eastern Iran, Southern Kazakhstan, etc. And as we covered, each of these Khanates fared very differently and generally didn't get along with one another as well. In fact, after the Mongol Empire split, other than a few brief moments under Kublai Khan and his grandson Temur Khan, both who were leaders of the Yuan Dynasty, the United Mongolian Empire was gone for good, and the Khanates often were at war with one another. All four Khanates are important to the story of Timur, but our focus and interest is primarily with the Chagatai Khanate. If you'll remember from our episode on the Chagatai Khanate, it had a pretty complicated history. The family of Chagatai, a son of Genghis Khan, and whom this Khanate had been given to, well, Chagatai's family was quite large, and it only continued to get larger. This meant that no matter how comfy you were on the throne of the Chagatai Khanate, there was always at least one annoying distant cousin or half-brother or forgotten uncle who was trying to murder you and take your throne. And so the history of the Chagatai Khanate, with the exception of a handful of notable, notable skilled rulers, it was just this long line of assassinations, backstabbings, rebellions, and civil wars. And on top of all this, the Chagatai Khanate was splitting in half, culturally, politically, and re religiously. The western half consisted of a population that was solidly a mix of Turks, Mongols, and Persians who were continuing to intermarry, live with, and sort of blend into one another, if you will. The western half was also primarily Islamic and had a mix of nomadic, settled, and agricultural peoples. On the other hand, you have the eastern half. And this part was ethnically still mostly Mongolian, very, very nomadic still, with limited settled groups, and mostly either pagan or Buddhist or Nestorian Christian. And this divide between these two parts only continued to grow. And on top of all of this, in the 1330s and 1340s, the Black Death begins passing through Asia, weakening or destroying pretty much every aspect of life. And on top of all of this, in 1346 or 1347, the last Khan of the Chagatai Khanate, Khan Kazin, was killed in battle against a coalition of rebels. All of these factors proved too much to bear for the Chagatai Khanate, and so in the late 1340s, probably around 1347, the Chagatai Khanate essentially collapsed, with both of those two halves we just went over forming their own little empires or kingdoms, if you will. And we left the narrative here with the leader of the rebellion, a man by the name of Amir Kazagan, taking control of the western half, which is usually referred to as Mawarinar or Transoxiana, which left the eastern half, typically called Magulistan, to its own devices. And on this political scene of the area of the time, this is where we left it. Then we finished last episode with the birth of Timur, with the traditional date of April 8th or April 9th in 1336, and a little bit on his early life. So that brings us to today. For this episode, I've split the material into three parts. As I've said many, many times, Timur's early life and rise to power is, without a doubt, the most complicated and confusing portion of his life. So we are going to be really careful to make sure we don't get lost here. Uh, here's where we're going to go today. We will begin by looking at the eastern half of the Chagatai Khanate, Magulistan. What happens here after the collapse slash split of the Chagatai Khanate, we're going to find out. Then we will head back to Mawarinar, the western half, to see how this new leader, the leader of the rebellion, Amir Kazagan, how he fares and what he does. 
And finally, today we will look at Timur. We'll take a, a bit more time talking about his upbringing, his tribe, his family, his early years. And then, at the very end of this episode, all three of these sections will converge. Now keep in mind, although we're going through these one by one, these topics will be happening simultaneously. It's just that I think the narrative will be less confusing if we hit them one at a time. But just remember that this is all going on in the 1330s, 1340s, and eventually the 1350s. And I, we'll walk you through, don't worry. Who's we in that sentence? Uh, that's creepy. Okay, so let's move on. With the collapse of the Chakotay Khanate in 1347, its eastern half, Magulistan, became autonomous. Today, this region would include parts of western China, parts of Kazakhstan, and parts of Kyrgyzstan. As for the name Magulistan, it's actually quite simple. Mogul is the Persian word for Mongol. Easy. As for the suffix portion stan, or stan, that is Persian for the place of. And this is why there are so many stan countries, if you will, in Central Asia. Afghanistan is the place of the Afghans, thus Afghanistan. Uzbekistan is the place of the Uzbeks, thus Uzbekistan. And Magulistan is the place of the Mongols. Now, funny enough, it isn't. Mongolia is really the place of the Mongols, but of course, by this time, there were Mongols all over the place for reasons we've been covering in, like, all of this podcast. So, that is Magulistan, or Magulistan, and as we said, Magulistan was still very Mongolian culturally. They were largely tribal, nomadic, Buddhist, or pagan, and still very engaged with Mongolian law and custom. They still preferred being ruled by the Yasa, or the Code of Laws, and with the political system of Khanship, or having a Khan to rule over and unite the tribes. Unfortunately, though, there was no Khan here. After Khan Khazan of the Chakotay Khanate was killed in battle, no ruler had enough power to take his place. So Mughalistan was plunged into a very disunited tribal system, with wars and petty squabbles very quickly breaking out between the various tribes. Now, the most powerful of the tribes in Magulistan was the Duklat tribe, and this tribe was actually led by three brothers. And very quickly, these guys started to do some thinking. Hey, we want to rule over all of the tribes in Magulistan, but how do we do that? We're not Khans, we're just leaders of the Duklats. Well, hey, wait a minute. What if we did what some of the rulers of the former Chagatay Khanate had done? What if we find some random dude who is maybe loosely related to the Chagatai and thus related to the Genghis Khan? Hear me out. What if we find a guy like this, proclaim him the rightful Khan of Magulistan, and demand the other tribes submit to this rightful heir? But here's the catch. We strip him of all power and leave him as this mere puppet Khan and rule Magulistan through him. Well, this sounded pretty good to the brothers, so they, they did exactly this. And to nobody's surprise, they found a guy who fit this description. This was a man by the name of Tugluk Timur, or Tugla Timur. Which, yes, another Timur, but this is Tugluk Timur. And do your best to remember that name because he's pretty darn important to the story of our Timur. So Tugluk Timur was, at this time, living in relative forgotten obscurity in eastern Magulistan. But he was actually the son of Esenbuka, who was the son of Duwa, names you might remember from our Chagatai Khanate episode. Duwa was the son of Barak Khan, and this went up a few more generations, all the way to Chagatai, and then, yes, indeed, to Genghis Khan himself. Now, of course, this whole genealogy may have been crap. That is, Tugluk Temer may, ne he, 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 he may not have been able to talk like me, no, he, he could talk, but he may not have been actually descendant of Genghis Khan. This genealogy could have been propaganda that these three brothers made up and then it was perpetuated by Tugluk Timur himself. This wouldn't surprise me. But also, on the other hand, he very well could have been part of this genealogy. Either way is possible, but in the end, here's the thing, it doesn't really matter because it worked. The people believed it. Tugluk Timur was brought before the Duklat brothers, he was showered with gifts and honors, and he was pronounced the rightful Khan of Mughulistan and the true heir of Genghis Khan. But you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned the names of these three Duklat brothers. They do have names, we have the names, but all we need to know really is the name of Tugluk Timur. Because if these three brothers had wanted a puppet Khan whom they could manipulate and rule through, they had picked the opposite of such a man. 
We unfortunately just don't know too much about Tugluk Timur's personality or the ins and outs of how he took control of Mogulistan. All we know is that he did, and he did it quickly and in a way that left little room for opposition. Probably by 1347, in the same year that the Khanate split, Tugluk Timur had gone from being some forgotten, maybe lost descendant of Genghis Khan to being the Khan of Mogulistan. Again, we don't know much, but it seems that he was a driven, wise, and quite an intelligent guy who wanted more power. And because of who he was, his personality and his traits, he was able to become the sole Khan, the sole ruler of Mogulistan. Now, one thing we do know about when he was Khan was he brought on a pretty big change for this, this new territory of his and the peoples of Mogulistan. The story goes that on one day, Tugluk Timur, the new Khan, he was out with his pals, hunting in an area that was strictly forbidden for anybody else to set foot on. This land was for wild animals only, so that Tugluk Timur could then have fun hunting the animals. But sure enough, the hunting party soon came upon a trespasser, this battered old Persian man. Now let me just stop here to say at this time in history, there was a lot of hatred and bigotry between Persians and Mongols. This wasn't everywhere or everyone, of course, but it was certainly very common. Many Persians hated Mongols because Genghis Khan's invasion of Persia was one of the bloodiest chapters of Persian history. A actually, it was a pretty... one of the bloodiest chapters in world history. And Mongolian rule over the Persians since then hadn't been in a walk in the park either. And the Mongols viewed the Persians as utterly inferior, because if they were equals, then how were they so easily conquered? You get the idea. So Tugluk Timur, a Mongol, and his friends, probably other Mongols, came across this unarmed old Persian man who was trespassing on their land. This doesn't look too good. They confronted him, and Tugluk Timur demanded to know why this man was trespassing, to which the Persian... What are... Are they dancing up there? I'm about to go dance with them. Anyway, so <laughs> they confront this Persian man and Tugluk Timur demands to know why are you trespassing on my land? And the Persian man replies that he was unaware that he was trespassing. And at this point, because of his accent, the men realize that this was a Persian and the insults and the crude jokes just start to fly. And these insults culminated in Tugluk Timur laughing and exclaiming, ha, huh, even a dog is worth more than a Persian. And to this, the man replied, You are correct. If we had not the true faith, we would indeed be worth no more than dogs. Tugluk Timur was taken aback by this unexpected answer and told the man to explain his faith. Now, this faith, this faith was, of course, Islam, and after hearing about it, Tugluk Timur was convinced. He converted, was circumcised, and perhaps as many as 160,000 other moguls also converted. Probably not that many, but definitely large numbers. And from here on out, Islam had an increasingly important role to play in the region. Now, some historians have debated on whether or not this was a true conversion. Did Tugluk Timur actually believe in the tenets of Islam, or was this just a political move? We will never know, of course, and I'm not going to pretend like I have the answer. I generally like to give people the benefit of the doubt in history, but here's the thing. Tugluk Timur's conversion brought about an interesting question. Sure, he may be the Khan of Mogulistan, and that, that's great, buddy, but his ancestors had ruled all of the Chagatai Khanate, both halves, and Tugluk Timur had no control over the western half. Now, like we covered, the western half was predominantly Muslim, and Muslims in this area had, had often suffered under non-Muslim Mongol Khans. Persecuting Muslims was a favorite pastime of pagan Khans. And these tribes in the west, fiercely Islamic, enjoying this new taste of autonomy, they might not like the idea of some pagan or Buddhist old-style Mongol trying to subjugate them. But if he happens to be a devout follower of the Prophet, that might tip the odds in his favor. Again, we don't know, but Tugluk Timur did turn his eyes westwards soon after his conversion. As a rightful heir of Chagatai, and, uh, and a descendant of Chagatai, he deserved both parts of the Chagatai Khanate. As a Muslim, it would be easier to acquire the support of the mostly Islamic population there. He had the military might and the support to conquer. All he needed was the right opportunity to make it happen. Now before we move on, one quick note. This may sound like all of this happened very fast, but what we just covered with Tugluk Timur happened over 13 years or so. 
1347 is when Tughlaq Timur took control of Mogulistan, and 1360 is when, I know I'm giving away the story, but he will invade the western half of Mawarnar. And of course, somewhere in between those two years, he converted to Islam. But for now, put that story on the back burner because it's time to rewind a bit back to 1347, back to the split of the Chagatai Khanate, to see what happened in the western half. Kazagan, the leader of the rebellion, had killed the last Chagatai Khan, Khan Kazan, in 1346 to 1347. Then the Khanate split, Magulistan went off and did their thing, which we just talked about, leaving Kazagan in control of the western portion, Transoxiana, Transoxania, or Mawarnar, you'll, you'll hear different names, it all refers to this western portion. The land beyond the river, that fertile crescent-like land in and around the Amu Darya River and the Sur Darya River. And in this land lived several tribes that now found themselves under the leadership of this, this rebel leader, Kazagan. I listed these tribes last episode, and we'll get more into them next episode, but for now, let's just say that there are several tribes here. Five of your more powerful tribes, a few more sort of moderately influential tribes, and then a, a bunch of smaller tribes. Kazagan was the leader of one of the five most powerful tribes, the Karaunas tribe, and they were based in the southern portion of Mawarnar. This was where Kazagan was the most powerful, in the south, where his people were, where most of his soldiers and supporters were, and he knew this. Further, it seems that Kazagan was quite content to let most of the other tribes do what they want. He never proclaimed himself the new Khan, but was fine with being called Amir Kazagan. He did appoint a puppet Khan of the Chagatai family, but again, Kazagan didn't really try to be too hands-on as a ruler. He was happy to rule in the south and leave the northern tribes to do what they wanted for the most part, as long as, you know, they in name submitted to him, but he's not going to be this top-down approach of, of a leader. Because of this outlook, how he ruled, most of the sources on Kazagan view him as a wonderful and a just and a wise ruler who was just loved by the people and respected by the tribes for letting them be, which is something that we're just not used to with Mongolian history. And oddly enough, Kazagan managed to stay in power for quite some time, ruling from about 1347 until 1358. During this time, he mostly just let the tribes be content to focus on his own, his own things with his own tribe. At one point, he did lead a great raiding invasion of India, just like the Chagatai lords had done before him, and just as Timur would do decades later. But with that constantly shifting diplomacy that was always going on with these tribes, Kazagan also later supplied mercenaries to the Sultan of Delhi. But of course, Kazagan was not the only one looking to expand. The city of Herat in modern-day northwestern Afghanistan is situated quite close to the land of Mawarnar. And at this time, and indeed throughout much of history, Herat was this regional powerhouse. And since the Chagatai Khanate was now fractured, the leader of the city of Herat, a man probably by the name of Malek Hussein, decided now would be a good time to raid or, or take up some of the land that was formerly part of the Chagatai Khanate. Thus, in the year 1351 or so, somewhere around there, Hussein launched raids against Kazagan's land, particularly against his allied tribes, the Apardi and the Arlat tribes, who were under his rule and protection. So Kazagan, in retaliation, gathered his forces, mostly from those southern tribes. Remember, he, his tribe, the Karaunas tribe, is a southern tribe. That's where most of his power comes from. So he gathers his soldiers and marches on the city of Herat. Malek Hussein decided to meet Kazgan in open battle outside of the city's walls instead of defending in a siege. But the defenders soon found themselves at this distinct disadvantage. In order to attack Kazagan's forces, they would be charging uphill and looking directly into the rising sun. Not a good position, but they gave battle anyway. And we're told that the fighting here was quite intense between Kazagan's forces and the, uh, the tribes of Mawarnar versus Hussein and the city of Herat. And we are told that the fighting was quite intense, with the defenders crying out very early that no quarter be given, and then they were immediately answered by the attackers yelling, take no prisoners. So right away, everybody understands that this is a fight to the death. There's going to be no mercy here. And the Zafar Nama, one of our best sources on Timur, describes the fighting with this tremendous, and I, I love this description, it just makes the scene come to life. It says this, 
Everyone showed his valor and strength, and the field was soon covered with blood, shields, helmets, and lances mixed with the dead who every moment fell from their horses. Wow, that's, that is pretty intense. Eventually, though, the army of Herat broke, and the defenders fled back behind the safety of the walls. Amir Kazagan then drew up the trenches of siege, and the city was starved for 40 days. By the end of these 40 days, Hussein and the other defenders knew that surrender was really their only option left. They didn't have enough food and water to last much longer, and they didn't have the, the manpower to offer battle again. Thus, Hussein sent lavish gifts to Kazagan and officially surrendered the city to him. Now, here, here's where things might sound a bit odd to you and I. In most cases, especially within medieval history, failed opposition against attackers didn't end well. Typically, the rules of war in the ancient and medieval world was this. If you are the ruler of a city and you give your city over to the attackers without a fight, no bloodshed, then typically, you, your city, and your people would be treated well. There may be some looting, sure, but that's, that, that's just what soldiers do. But generally, if you didn't resist them, things would be okay. You might even be allowed to keep your position of power. But, if you resisted them, and then you lost... Expect no mercy. This is what the phrase woe to the vanquished refers to. In medieval and ancient history, sieges were incredibly difficult for the people within the city, yes, of course, but also very difficult for the attackers. Successful sieges were few and far between. I came across one military historian who estimated that only about 5% of sieges that we have records of actually worked out for the attackers. And while they're sieging you, they're likely dealing with their own little hell of disease, hunger, thirst, being constantly shot at, raiding parties, all sorts of things. Thus, there was this sort of unspoken rule that if you resisted the attackers, and if they actually beat you, then they had the right to do whatever the hell they wanted to do to you and your city. Therefore, ancient and medieval history is just full of these horrific slaughters after successful sieges. Is this appalling? Absolutely. But, given the warfare of the day, it's not unexpected. But what is unexpected is Hussein and his city of Herat raiding Kazagan's land, fighting against him outside the city, letting him besiege them for 40 days, and finally surrendering. And then Kazagan graciously accepts the surrender, allows Hussein to live, and to remain the leader of Herat. And he doesn't slaughter the entire population of the city. He does sack it, and he does take some of the people as slaves, but he doesn't kill them all. And this goes back to what we talked about last week, with the politics of how the tribes and the various peoples living in Central Asia functioned at this time. Loyalty to a lord or to a tribe was not a be-all, end-all code of conduct. People switched sides. A lot. And yeah, it, it probably wasn't too encouraged, but it certainly wasn't surprising if one of your enemies just suddenly wanted to join ranks with you, or vice versa. Everybody is just trying to survive, and also maybe trying to climb up a rung or two in whatever social or political ladder that they're, that they're part of. I need, to, I need to speak much slower. Anyway, this is really important to understand because during all of Timur's life, there is this fluid state of loyalty with people constantly changing sides. In the most important battle, arguably, of Timur's life, a large Part of the outcome of this battle will be due to certain tribes switching sides in the middle of the battle. I'm not going to give any, any more away. So, people change loyalties to serve their interests best here. This is why leaders like Genghis Khan or Monk Khan or indeed Timur himself had to be constantly expanding, constantly at war, constantly winning over those slaves and those riches to shower upon their soldiers. This was really the easiest way to keep the loyalties of these men behind you. The more you reward the men under you, the less likely they'll go searching for reward from somebody else. Similarly, in this case of Hussein and Kazagan, Kazagan was not looking for a die-hard loyalist who would be behind him even to death. That's just not how society worked. No, all Kazagan needed was to defend his tribes and to have a leader who knew how to run this newly conquered or subdued city of Herat. Hussein was the obvious choice, even though he was the guy who had started the problem in the first place. But Kazagan, he fixed that. Hussein was defeated, he was humbled, and then he was shown mercy and now was expected to carry on. Anyway, speaking of carrying on, 
let's get back to the story at hand. There's one more thing we need to talk about in regards to Amir Kazagan's rule before we get to Timur. As we covered earlier, Kazagan was quite content staying within his little hub of influence in the southern portion of Mawarnar, in the south, with the tribes that were most friendly to him, his supporters there, including, of course, his own tribe, the Karaunas. This allowed the northern tribes to kind of do their own thing, even though that, yes, of course, they were technically under his leadership. Well, here's the thing. Kazagan had a son, and his son's name was Mirza Abdallah. And Abdallah was a skilled commander. He even, he even led his father's army in a conquest of Khwarezmia one time. But the more important thing is he didn't like the idea that his dad was content with just sticking to the south. And so, somewhere along Kazagan's reign, Abdallah moved north to set up his residence in the city of Samarkand, which was located very close to most of those northern tribes. Now, Abdallah may have chosen to come here on his own, his father may have recommended it, but we're not too sure. The point is to remember that while Kazagan is content with the south, his son will probably try to spread his authority to the northern tribes as well once his father has died. Which, that happens. We'll get to it, but that happens. Anyway, before we wrap up with Kazagan, we need to ask ourselves one thing. Where is Timur in all of this? Well, he may have been with us this whole time. He may have been in Kazagan's army at the Siege of Herat. He may have been there at the surrender of the city. Uh, but to investigate this, we need to go back in time once again, yes, to look at Timur's early life. We touched on it a bit last week, but let's talk about it again now, now that we're all caught up with the regional politics. Timur was born into the Barlas tribe, one of the more powerful tribes in the western half of the Chagatai Khanate. That is, the region of Transoxiana or Transoxania, Mawarinar, it goes by several names. Whatever you want to call it is fine. But again, there are those, those five very powerful tribes and then many others that are less powerful. Well, the Barlas tribe was one of the more powerful tribes, one of those five more powerful tribes. And it was at this time partially nomadic, partially agricultural, and even partially completely settled. And they inhabited the land around the modern day city of Sharizabs in Uzbekistan. At that time though, this town was still called Kish or Kesh, or sometimes just the Green City. And it is here or near this town that Timur was born in the year 1336, according to the traditional date of his birth. The Barlas tribe was originally a Mongol tribe that had accompanied Genghis Khan on his initial conquest of, the, of this area over a century before. And for their service, they were given the land around Kesh, and since then, they had really started to blend in with the locals. Most of the Barlas tribe's members adopted Islam, started speaking in an old Turkish dialect, and began intermarrying with the locals as well. And we talked about this before. In most places where the Mongols conquered, they were ethnic and cultural minorities, and as such, with enough time, they were somewhat absorbed by the ethnic and cultural groups that surrounded them. In the Yuan Dynasty, most of the Mongols adopted more and more Chinese ways of life. In the Golden Horde, the Mongols started to reflect Slavic, Turkic, or uh, old Kipchak aspects. In the Ilkhanate, the Mongols became more and more Persian. And in the land of the Chagatai Khanate, the Mongols became more and more Turkish. Thus, speaking solely on ethnicity with Timur, we're not 100% sure what his ethnicity was. There are quite a few sources that fervently say Timur was Mongolian. There are other sources that fervently say he was Turkish. And as you can imagine, this is still a pretty hot topic to today. He was likely partially both, as many of the people living here at the time were. And what makes this rather frustrating is that we can't just look at his parents to pin down his lineage. Because long story short, we don't know who his parents were. Sure, we know their names, Targai and Takina. We know they were members of the Barlas tribe, and we know that his father had some level of authority within the tribe. But anything more than this tends to get pretty complicated pretty fast. Here's how this often plays out. Sources that are very anti-Timur often portray Timur's family as a bunch of poor, barbaric animals, almost. As if to say, see, this is where Timur came from. He's a horrible loser from a family of pathetic loser barbarians. For example, Arab Shah, a very anti-Timur writer, says that Timur came from a people lacking either reason or religion. But what's weird is some of our sources that are very pro-Timur also take a similar point of view, as if to say, see, Timur came from nothing, absolute poverty, no power or authority or following at all, and this makes his rise to power and his personality all the more incredible. 
And then, of course, we've got a few sources that say, nah, Timur's father was actually a pretty important guy. Maybe he even owned 10,000 horses. We just don't know. But here's what is safe to say. Timur's father, Targai, had some amount of wealth and authority. Maybe not much, sure. But when Targai dies years later, Timur will return home to make sure the estate and the will is in order. And that seems to imply that Timur's father, Targai, had at least something. But we also know that Targai was not the leader of the Barlas tribe, nor was he really set up to be the leader later on down the line, meaning that Timur was also not a likely candidate to inherit the leadership. And we know this because Timur really has to play some political chess in order to gain this leadership. But for now, in Timur's early life, his tribe, the Barlas tribe, is led by a man named Haji Beg. Now, this Haji Beg may possibly have been Timur's uncle, although there's some speculation on this as well. Of course there is, there's speculation on everything. Uh, but most sources claim that Haji Beg was indeed Timur's uncle, which uh, recently it's been even more questioned. But because this was the original narration that Haji Beg, the leader of the Barlas tribe, was Timur's uncle, that's probably what we're going to go with. But here's the thing, it doesn't really matter if he was or wasn't, just because you may be the nephew of the leader of the tribe in no way guarantees that you will one day take his place. Remember that these tribes did not work like monarchies, no. The best man for the job ruled the tribe. Family ties had little to do with succession. All this to say, Timur isn't going to inherit rule over the Barlas tribe. He knows it, you know it, I know it. The Barlas tribe knows it. If he wants to rule the tribe, he's going to have to earn it. Okay, now we need to talk a bit more about Timur's parents. Because wait, you say, or somebody says, I've heard that Timur was a descendant of Genghis Khan, or at least a descendant of the old Mongolian aristocracy from the times of Genghis Khan. Surely that would increase his influence. Well, okay, here's the thing. We just don't know for certain. So... Through Terogai, Timur's father, that is, several of our sources trace Timur's ancestors all the way back to a guy by the name of Karakar Noyan, who was a contemporary of Genghis Khan. Now, Karakar almost certainly existed, but just how important of a guy he was is up for debate. Mongol sources that predate Timur barely mention Karakar Noyan. He was a Mongol warrior who supported and fought under Genghis Khan. He eventually was given command over a thousand soldiers. He suppressed a rebellion in a city in Persia. And then he was assigned to the retinue of Chagatai Khan, which of course leads to Karakar's descendants growing up where Timur would eventually be born. That's really all that the Mongol sources say. But if you read the Timurid sources written after Timur that describe Karakar Noyan, well, he's the real deal. He's not just some random Mongol lord. He's actually a distant cousin of Genghis Khan. And he didn't lead a thousand men. He led 10,000. Oh, and he was actually one of Genghis Khan's closest advisors. Oh, and Genghis Khan, when he died, he may have personally blessed Karakarnoyan as he lay dying. So this guy is quite a big deal, according to our pro Timur sources. Which version is true? You can kind of decide for yourself. Yes, Timur was probably a descendant of the Mongol Karakarnoyan, but just who this guy was and how important he was is up for debate. As for Timur's mother, Takina, things are even more muddled. She may have been a direct descendant of Genghis Khan. She may have been from a lineage of Persian royalty. She may have been a nobody from a nobody peasant family. We just don't know. Most of our sources say that, well, they don't even mention her or she's barely mentioned. Uh, what we do know, though, is Timur was probably very close to her when growing up. As far as Timur's parents, though, his lineage, where his family come from, it's all kind of up in the air. What we do know for certain, what pretty much all of our sources indicate, is that Timur was a part of the Barlas clan. His father had some level of authority, but certainly not had leadership of, of the Barlas tribe. Some of Timur's ancestors can be linked back to the initial days of Genghis Khan, but nothing in Timur's position or family... It, nothing promised him power in the Barlas tribe. Again, if he wants authority or power, he's gonna have to earn it. And this is one thing that I love about Timur's story. Alexander the Great was born into power. His, his king, his king, his, well, his king and his father was the king of Macedon. Wow, really stumbled through that sentence. Alexander's father was King Philip of Macedon. Great, there we go. Attila the Hun was born into power. Attila's uncles were the kings of the Hunnic Empire. So many of these one-man empire builders were set up to go wild from the start, right? 
Timmer doesn't have this luxury. Nothing is guaranteed for this young boy playing on the banks of the Chicartes. To make his name echo throughout history, he's going to have to be the first guy to yell. And speaking of Timur as a boy, let's talk again about his childhood and early life. I know we talked about this a bit last episode, but I want to touch on it again. So let's take Timur's traditionally given birth year of 1336, okay? Now let's leap forward to where we're going to end today's episode, that is, with Timur's real entrance into verifiable history that all of our sources agree on, which is in the year, let's just say, 1360. So if we accept these important dates, 1336 is the year Timur is born, and 1360 is the year he enters onto the historical stage, that's about 25 years. He's probably about 25 years old. So what happened in his life during those first, first 25 years? Well, we don't know. Most of our sources are completely silent on his early life. They'll give maybe a few basic, basics, his tribe, his parents, etc., but then they'll jump ahead several decades to the juicy political material. But, and here it is again, this is where things get complicated and controversial again. We do have a source that goes into quite a bit of detail on Timur's early life, and this is the autobiography of Timur himself. It's time to talk about this. Timur's autobiography, or the memoirs and the institutes, it does exist. You can download it for free. And it goes into great detail telling the whole life of Timur, how he conquered, what he believed, who he was, how he ruled, etc. Up until very recently, pretty much everybody accepted this autobiography as the definitive source on Timur. After all, what source could possibly be better on Timur than the man's own autobiography? And even today, in much of Central Asia especially, the autobiography is viewed as legitimate and kind of the source on Timur. And if this autobiography is real, then it is not only the best source on Timur, that's just a given, but it's one of the best sources we have on all of 14th century history. But here's where things get sticky. First of all, remember that if you don't know, Timur is going to forge a vast empire. And his family will remain in power over this empire for years even after Timur's death. Then, even when the Timurid Empire collapses, some of Timur's descendants will eventually form a new empire, the Mughal Empire of India, and they will remain in power there for many more years. And we will get into all of this later on down the road, don't worry, but just keep in mind that there are quite a few people who would greatly benefit from histories that portray Timur in the best of lights. And if Timur is shown as a brilliant, wise, religious, and legi legitimate ruler, then that may help legitimize the rule of some of his descendants later on down the line. I'm not saying that's what happened because I don't know, and there's no way to prove it either way. I'm just encouraging you to keep that in mind. And also, most importantly, please know that I'm not trying to offend anybody at all. I know Timur can be remembered very differently depending on where you are, where you live, and who you are. And I want to do my best to respect that. So if we disagree on something, know that I'm not trying to offend you or, or your history or anyone in any way. Oh, and obviously feel free to reach out to me at any time for any reason. That invite is always out there. Okay, so keeping everything in mind, Timur's autobiography, well, this is where it gets sketchier. It was lost for years after he wrote it. It was forgotten and lost for over 200 years. Then, during the reign of one of Timur's distant descendants, Timur's autobiography was found, which may raise some warning flags for skeptics. And what makes things possibly more sketchy is that the original manuscript has never been retrieved. We only have the translations of the men who found it over 200 years after Timur's death. Further, no contemporary source from Timur's life mentions the existence of his autobiography. Maybe he kept it a secret from them, even from guys he hired to write about his life? Maybe, we don't know. But here, here's my biggest issue with Timur's autobiography. Just read it! You don't need to know much about Timur at all. If you were to know nothing about Timur, and I just said, look, he was a nomadic conqueror who forged an empire that stretched across several modern-day countries. Some remember him as a hero. Some remember him as a ruthless killer. Here's his autobiography. If that's all you knew, you'd probably have some questions really quick. His autobiography reads as though Timur is fulfilling some long-lost prophecy. Now again, this is all my opinion, and I'm not an expert on it. 
but the book it doesn't make the claim that he's a prophet but it reads as if it does almost if he's sort of this important religious figure in every single story timur is right he almost never makes mistakes. And the book goes way out of its way to show you just how right Timur is. Even to the point where there are stories that really don't matter at all, except to remind you that Timur was right and everybody else was wrong. In one story, Timur and a couple of his companions get lost at night in the desert. Then through the haze, they see several small black hills, to which all of Timur's companions exclaim, Look at those small black hills. Then Timur responds, those are not hills, those are tents, let's go. And guess what? Timur is right. They're tents, everybody is saved. Now that may have happened. And look, Timur certainly was a genius. He certainly was gifted in countless ways, obviously. I mean, the guy is going to create an empire and a legacy with his own two hands. But at certain points, the autobiography seems a bit over the top, Especially when you remember that Timur is usually remembered by, by most people for being one of the most ruthless and bloodthirsty conquerors who ever lived. My favorite example of this is a story that comes from the autobiography of how Timur is, he's walking along a street as a young man one day, when suddenly he steps on an ant. It was an accident. He didn't mean to, but he crushed and killed this ant. And Timur feels so heartbroken and miserable at this act of meaningless killing that he goes running to a nearby religious leader and vows before him to never harm another living creature. Now, if this was a story about Zarathustra or Jesus or Buddha or somebody like that, I might buy it. But this is Timur, the sword of Islam, the prince of destruction, and I just can't buy that he vowed to never hurt the innocent. But look, I could be wrong. I am in no way an expert on Timurid sources. So please, again, I know this is very controversial. I know this book means a lot to some people. So I'm going to lay my cards out on the table and say this. I'm not going to be relying on Timur's autobiography as much as some people might like me to. We will still certainly refer to it at times because it's, even if it's fake, it's still very valuable to us because it was written by his descendants hundreds of years later, and that reflects what may have been important to them. And all of this is unfortunate because if we set aside Timur's autobiography, we, we really just don't have much material on his childhood and early life. And I hate to do this because despite that whole rant I just went on, his autobiography does have some absolutely wonderful stories that bring him to life so much more. I think last episode I told you one of these stories, how as a child, Timur was organizing and drilling his friends in mock war. Uh, and, and I can see that happening. I mean, we know that Timur is going to lead tens of thousands of troops. And when I was a kid, I was doing the same thing with my friends. It's not unbelievable. Then there's another wonderful story of Timur's father, Targai, who, according to the autobiography, became somewhat of a, a religious figure who increasingly rejected the world in order to pursue the spiritual realm. So in this story, Targai doesn't like dwelling on things like war or politics or killing because, he, again, he wants to focus on more pure religious spiritual things. But then one day, Targai starts telling Timur about their ancestors. And even though Targai has rejected the world, he can't help but let his eyes light up as he's telling little Timur about how their ancestors, under the leadership of the mighty Genghis Khan, once ruled the world and galloped wherever they wanted with nobody challenging them. And little Timur just eating this up. And this is a story I can absolutely believe. My dad did the same thing with me. One of my ancestors, the guy who I'm actually named after, another James, fought in the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War. And in the American Civil War, the Battle of Shiloh was one of the turning points in the whole war and certainly the turning point of the Western theater. And the turning point of this battle was when the Confederate surprise attack was overrunning all of the Union forces. General Grant and his men were being slaughtered, retreat was cut off, they were about to be driven into the river where no doubt they would drown. But then several Union soldiers, including some farm boys from Iowa, including my ancestor James, turned around from fleeing and fought back. This sacrifice of this handful of boys, and indeed it was a sacrifice, most were either killed or captured, it became known as the hornet's nest because the constant whizzing of bullets was reminiscent of angry hornets. 
Okay, long story short, the stand at the hornet's nest gave Grant enough time to reorganize a counterattack which eventually totally reversed the fate of the battle and eventually the war. And James, my ancestor, was captured and spent the rest of, of the war in a Confederate POW camp. But eventually he made it home, had a family, and that family eventually led to me. And my dad, being the total legend that he, that he is, took me to the battlefield of Shiloh to where my ancestor had thrown everything to the wind to save his army, and then my dad told me this whole story. That's powerful stuff. That is inspiring. That is a moment that I will remember until the day I die, and in certainly a different tone but similar way, I can see Targai telling Timur about who they are, where they came from, the heroes of the steppe, the daring raids that their ancestors went on, how Genghis Khan built this empire with his own two hands. And I'm sure little Timur remembered these stories. I'm sure they had an impact on him. So that's the unfortunate thing about the autobiography. It's, it's filled with these stories that I really like and I can believe. But it's also filled with other stories that I, I just can't. Anyway, moving on. Okay, so do we know anything for sure about Timur's early life these first 25 years or so? Yes. Yes, we do. Let's start with looking at one of our best sources on Timur's life, but a source that is 110% in the anti-Timur camp. This source is written by a man named Ahmad ibn Arab Shah, and we've heard from him a bit before, and we will certainly hear more from him in the future. And I'll tell you about this guy's life too, because he, he has a fascinating story. But for now, because this episode is also already way too long, just believe me when I say that Arab Shah hated Timur with every fiber in his being, and also that he had every imaginable reason to do so. This is a guy who suffered directly from Timur's hand, survived, wrote about it, and then those writings survived down to us today. Very valuable stuff. But in his history, Arab Shah wants to make it very clear that he thinks Timur is the worst person ever. And that's not an exaggeration. Sometimes Arab Shah will just blatantly make things up just to make Timur seem even worse. But perhaps the most valuable aspect of Arab Shah's work is that even he compliments Timur at times. And it's at these rare moments where we have to pause. Because if Arab Shah admits something remotely positive about Timur, then it's probably true. And on Timur's transition from child to man, Arab Shah admits that he grew up, quote, brave, great-hearted, active, strong, and polite. And further, he attracted all sorts of other followers to him because of his compelling personality. In your life, in my life, we have met Timur. Hopefully not the nomadic warlord type, but we've all met that guy who when he enters the room, everybody is just aware of his presence. He has, he has that presence, that personality, and just that look that he's totally in charge. And maybe it's fear or admiration or compulsion for some reason, but you just automatically want to show him your best. You want to prove yourself to him. You want to follow him. This was Timur. And further, he was tall, he was muscular, broad-shouldered, several accounts make a point to say he had piercing eyes. This was a man who captured all attention wherever he went. And so it's no surprise that all, all of our sources indicate that in his early life, before stepping forward onto the stage of verifiable history, Timur started to gain followers. Anti-Timur sources tend to paint these followers as pretty despicable characters. Arab Shah even goes so far as to call them servants of Satan. And of course, pro-Timur sources heap all sorts of praise on these guys. But one thing is certain. These, these early followers of Timur were men who saw Timur as their doorway to betterment, to making something of themselves. Maybe they were evil men, maybe they were angels, maybe they were normal people like you and me. We don't know for certain, but this is the beginning. Timur is still a nobody. To become the Timur we know he will become, he has, to, he has all sorts of hoops he has to jump through. Before he can create an empire, he has to subdue the Chagatai Khanate. Before he can do that, he has to subjugate the western half of Transoxiana. And before that, he has to take control of his tribe, the Barlas. And before that, he has to have some sort of following. And that's just what he starts to, to do. This is step one of the long and difficult road he will walk. Timur needs men who follow him because he's Timur. 
And this is what happens. Men start to follow him. Friends, adventurers, maybe criminals, but men who are not just of the Barlas tribe, but from many different tribes. And this is critical because that means they're putting Timur before whatever tribe they may be a part of. If he only had followers from the Barlas tribe, well, as soon as a different and better Barlas leader comes forward, those men may easily be persuaded to jump ship and leave Timur. But Timur now has... Okay, they're dancing up there. They're running the dishwasher. I'm about to just move. I don't know where, but I'm about to move. Anyway, so... Timur now has men who have already left their tribes, and they have no loyalties to the Barlas tribe either, they only have Timur. And you'll see different numbers for this initial group of followers, of course, because nobody can agree on anything, but anywhere between 7 and 300 is likely. So somewhere in his early years, early 20s or so, before entering the historical scene for certain, we know that Timur had guys following and believing in him. There are also a few more things we can be certain of in regards to Timur's early life. Even if the various histories don't specifically mention these things, we know they happened. For example, Timur no doubt would have known how to fight or how to hunt. But to nomads, there was very little difference between hunting wild beast and hunting man. The tactics and the weapons were very similar. And Timur no doubt learned how to shoot a bow while on horseback, how to hold a lance, and how to parry with a saber. He had to in order to survive as a nomad in this crumbling Chagatai Khanate world. Further, we also know that Timur learned how to master horseback riding on all sorts of terrain and weather. In fact, even very anti-Timurid sources admit that Timur was an expert on horsemanship. Arab Shah, remember that guy who has every reason to hate Timur? Arab Shah says that Timur could just glance at a horse and instantly tell whether or not it was from good stock or bad stock and thus maybe worth investing in. This is very important, but not too surprising. Timur's empire will be won on horseback, and it's no surprise that he knew horses well, how they lived, how to deal with their injuries, how to keep them healthy. This makes sense. If you look at the life of somebody like the German general Erwin, Erwin Rommel, especially in the Second World War, he was this brilliant tank general for many reasons, but including the fact that he knew how the actual tank worked as a machine. You can find pictures of him on the ground, in the mud, helping to repair these machines of war. That's huge! Among just being practical, that forms this automatic bond between you and the guys you're commanding. It shows that he understanded them on almost a personal level. He's sat in a crammed tank under fire before. He's only asking these tank crews to do something he's already done. And with Timur, he will press his soldiers to the absolute limit time and time again. But he's there on the saddle with them. He has to deal with the injured mounts and riding over hundreds of miles in mere days and with all the various weather elements of the steppe. Before Amir, or the Sword of Islam, or whatever other titles he will obtain, Timur is a soldier first and foremost. And this will remain important for his whole life. And speaking of soldier, that leads us to what Timur actually does in these early years with his band of followers. Because yes, he has some personal support now, sure, but that's still not nearly enough to challenge his uncle for control of the Barlas tribe. His uncle surely had personal retainers and friends as well. No, Timur needed more than this. He needed outside support from other tribes, he needed leadership and war experience, and he needed resources. So Timur and his war band set out. And surprise, surprise, there is disagreement on what they actually did. Of course there is. Here are the different views uh, that you'll find pretty easily, and then I'll give you what I think. Several of our sources, particularly some of our anti-Timur sources, claim that Timur and his guys simply became thieves and murderers, who hid in the hills and fell upon any traveler or merchant unlucky enough to fall prey. Or, as Arab Shah claims, they stole sheep from people. Sheep robbers. Uh, that's a pretty low life start for somebody who will one day rule a fourth of Asia. But it's from this viewpoint that we actually come across a first explanation for Timur's lameness. After all, this is Timur the lame we're talking about. And lame doesn't mean pathetic here, it means actually lame. At some point in his early life, Timur was injured in both the right arm and the right leg. And the wounds healed to some degree, but he would forever walk with a limp, leading to him being remembered by many as Timur the lame. 
And from this title of Timur the Lame, eventually this morphed into Tamerlane, especially in Western Europe. So that's why you, you'll hear Tamerlane or Timur the Lame or Timur or Timur or Timur. It's all the same guy. Anyway, so this is Timur the Lame, and this is true, he was lame. In the 1940s, Soviet archaeologists dug up Timur's tomb, investigated his body, and confirmed that A, he was tall for the time, standing at about 5 feet and 7 inches, but also sporting wounds in his right limbs that would have impeded his walking. And there are sources that we have that claim that Timur was a petty criminal or thief, and they attribute his wounds to being caught while trying to steal sheep. Arabshaw tells us that an alert shepherd shot Timur with two arrows, crippling him. Is this what happened? It is certainly a possibility, but we'll talk about Timur's injuries again next episode and look at the, the other theory about how he acquired them. As for other theories of what Timur did in his early adulthood, his autobiography tells us that he enlisted in Amir Kazagan's army. In fact, remember early, earlier in this episode when we talked about Kazagan marching against Hussein and the city of Herat and subduing them in battle and then accepting Hussein's surrender? Well, Timur's autobiography not only places Timur at all of these events, he's the main guy behind them all. Timur helps lead the forces of Kazagan against Hussein. It's Timur who creates the strategies to defeat Hussein. Timur personally then leads Hussein to Kazagan for his surrender. Again, according to the autobiography, Timur is always there, Timur is always right, Timur is always the main character. Now, what's most likely is that everybody's kind of right, but mostly wrong. Timur and his band of followers very possibly could have engaged in criminal activity. Yeah, this is just what armed men do a lot of the time when there aren't wars to fight. You use your weapons to steal from people. But in future episodes, we will see Timur be employed as a mercenary, several times actually. So what's also likely is that he took his followers to join Kazagan's coalition when Kazagan marched on Herat. Timur may have even accompanied Kazagan's raid into India or Kazagan's son's invasion of Khwarezmia. We just don't know. But Timur was almost certainly not the hero or even a prominent commander in Kazagan's army. Even if he was with Kazagan, it was probably as a lowly soldier or a mercenary with the command over uh, the few followers he had at the time. So there isn't too much more to discuss in regards to what Timur did prior to 1360 or so. And remember, that's a good chunk of his life. He would have been about 25 years old by 1360, or if we accept the theory that he was born even earlier, and we also accept that his autobiography wasn't actually written by him, Timur could have been as old as 35 before making it onto the political and historical scene. That's incredible. Alexander the Great was already dead by 35. And again, this is just another one of those crazy details that makes Timur's life and story so interesting. The vast majority of his campaigns and his rule are going to be done while he's middle-aged and, and an old man. And that makes things just so interesting. Okay, well, speaking of his entrance onto the historical scene in a way that all of our sources agree upon, let's actually get to that event. So let's go back to the political scene of the split Shagatai Khanate. In the eastern half of Magulistan, Tughlaq Timur has taken control of all the tribes there. He has been pronounced Khan, he's converted to Islam. In the western half, Pamwaranar, Amir Kazagan has been leading the tribes, but with rather a hands-off approach, especially in regards to the northern tribes. So let's jump back into this narrative. Despite going down in the histories as good and a well-liked ruler, Amir Kazagan did have his enemies. You can't just rule without making somebody angry with you. Now remember that Kazagan is the emir and ruler of Mawarnar, but he is also the leader of the Karaunas tribe. That's kind of where he came from, where his base of power resided. Well, before he led the Karaunas tribe, a man by the name of Borolde led it. And when Borolde died, Kazagan took control, and this rubbed Borolde's son the wrong way. I mean, we, we have talked about the best man for the job rules the tribe, but still, if if the ruler of the tribe was your dad and then you didn't get the power, that, mm, that might make you a bit upset. So, when Borodai dies, Kazagan takes control, and further, he denies uh, Borodai's son the leadership of many of his father's troops. I'm sure there were political reasons for these decisions, but the result of these actions is that the son of Borodai conspired to assassinate Amir Kazagan. So one day, 
Kazagan was out hunting with 15 or so of his friends, and unknown to them, the assassins were following their every move. At some point during the hunt, Kazagan wandered a bit too far from his friends, and the assassins made their move, lunging at him and killing him before the guards could stop them. The guards did hunt them down, and in another wonderfully descriptive line from the Zafarnama, they bathed their swords in the blood of the assassins. But as for, far as uh, Amir Kazagan, he was dead. Now, in Timur's autobiography, the story is a bit different. Kazagan does go out hunting with his friends, but this time Timur is with them as well. And when the assassins jump out, Timur draws his sword, throws himself in between them and his lord Amir Kazagan, and heroically fights them off, saving Kazagan's life. But alas, Kazagan loved to hunt, and he soon went out hunting again, and this time without Timur. And as you can expect, this meant that nobody was there to save Kazagan when the assassins fell on him for a second time. But then Timur arrives, and he hunts down the assassins, and he kills them all, and then he finds Kazagan's body and carries it back to the tribe to be buried. Do you see what I mean here when I said earlier that in every story, Timur is the guy, the protagonist who does everything? Okay, then if that's the case, why do none of our other sources that talk about this event even mention that Timur was present? Okay, anyway, that, that's, I digress. The point is that Amir Kazagan has been killed. Timur may have been present for this, but most likely was not. And Kazagan's son, Mirza Abdallah, immediately seizes his father's position as Amir and leader of Mawarnar. And this is where the problems only get worse. Remember from earlier that Abdallah wasn't pleased with only ruling the southern tribes like his father had done. No, he wants to rule the northern tribes as well. So he does, he packs up his stuff, he gathers his friends and soldiers and as many people as will go with him, and he sets out to the city of Samarkand to move his capital there. Now, Samarkand is positioned around the northern tribes, and Abdallah's advisors pleaded with him not to do this. Stay in the south as your father did. The southern tribes are far more friendly to us than the northern tribes who prefer just being left alone. But Abdallah would have none of this, they all belong to him, so he begins ruling from Samarkand. Now, when Kazagan was still alive and ruling, he had placed a puppet Khan on the throne of Mawarnar just as a formality, even though this man had no power whatsoever. The power resided with, of course, Amir Kazagan. Well, this puppet Khan named Bayan Kuli was still around and still alive and still, still doing whatever the puppet Khans do. But unfortunately for Bayan Kuli, Amir Abdallah really became infatuated with his, with his beautiful wife. So much so, in fact, that Abdallah flat out executes him. Executes the Khan. Puppet Khan, sure, but still somebody with the title of Khan. And then Abdallah seized Bayan Kuli's wife for his own. The year is 1359. Amir Abdallah has ruled for maybe a few months, but he has managed to make a lot of enemies very fast. He threatens the northern tribes by moving his capital to, well, his headquarters to Samarkand, and then he kills the puppet Khan because of lust. Do you want to guess what happens next? Yeah, exactly. A plot is hatched to remove Amir Abdallah from power. Now, these plotters said that the reason they were doing this was because Abdallah killed a Khan. And yes, execution of officials was generally looked down upon in Central Asia at this time, but killing a puppet Khan wasn't new. And when Timur is in power, we will see several puppet Khans come and go, and our sources don't seem to have a problem with that. Further, these plotters were also from northern tribes. What does this mean? It means that the reason for this, this coming insurrection was almost certainly mostly because the northern tribes wanted to remain as autonomous as possible. They're fine with submitting to some emir as long as he stays in the south where he belongs. And Abdallah is not doing that. And so the rebellion begins. Leading this rebellion are two men. We have a guy by the name of Buyan Saldas, who was the leader of the Saldas tribe, and apparently a very likable guy, a man who was eager to show hospitality and friendliness, but was also quite addicted to wine, women, and feasting, which meant that although his motives may, may be admirable, his actual leadership might be lacking. But that'll come more into play next episode. But the second man leading this rebellion was none other than Haji Beg, leader of the Barlas tribe and very possibly Timur's uncle as well. 
Thus, the Soldas and Barles tribes, along with other allies, confronted Amir Abdallah and ran him out of Samarkand, forcing him back down to the south, back to his tribe, back to where he belonged, and actually where he soon died there, soon thereafter. The coup had been a success. The northern tribes were now free to return to their own pastures, not servant to anybody. No emir, no prince, no other tribe, and certainly no khan. Timur may certainly have been a part of this rebellion. After all, he was a member of the Barlas tribe, and we know that soon we will find him alongside his uncle. So he may have been here all along, but most likely, this was all outside of Timur's small influence. So whether he was involved or not, he was no hero or leader yet. He only had a few followers and maybe a few friends in other tribes, but certainly no real position of power. But at least there is finally some sort of peace in Mawarnar. There is no emir and the tribes are free. Unfortunately for the free tribes, though, somebody was watching all of this happen with great interest. In the east, beyond the land of the rivers, to the realm of Mogulistan, Tughlaq Timur, Khan of the Mughals, told his vast hordes of warriors to prepare for war. The opportune moment for invasion had come. There was no emir in the west to, to face him anymore. There was nobody to unite the tribes against him. He was the Khan and a descendant of both Chagatai and the great Genghis. The whole of the Chagatai Khanate was rightfully his. And so, in late 1359 or early 1360, while the tribes of the west were celebrating this newfound freedom, the Mughals went to war. And although he may not have known it, about it yet, Timur was about to find himself in a storm of hardship, but a storm of opportunity. This has been the Timur Podcast. Thank you for listening and thanks for sticking with me in this very long episode. Uh, next time, which hopefully will be next week, but again, no promises. Things are, are still a bit crazy on my end. But next week, we will look at Tugluk Timur's invasion of Mawarnar and how Timur makes his first lunge into history. And, uh, one of, my, one of my favorite histories on this, basically everything we've talked about, is the book The Empire of the Steppes, a, a history of Central Asia, by the historian, I believe his name is René Grousset. That's how one of my professors said it. We're going to go with that. With that. Um, anyway, so René has this, he has this great line when he sums up what we just talked about in this episode. And it's this four-worded sentence that's just, Kazagan today, Tamerlane tomorrow. Now, before we bring this whole thing to a close, I do have one really exciting announcement. So, a few episodes back, we covered the Black Death, in particular the Black Death in the Middle East, in the Islamic world. And this episode was, not only was it my favorite episode to put together, um, but this is the episode I got the, the most positive feedback on it. It seems like a lot of people were very interested in hearing about the Black Death in light of current events, of course, but also just from a Middle Eastern perspective. Now, when preparing the Black Death episode, I quickly found that there just aren't many resources. There aren't many books on this subject. And the ones that I did manage to find all referred back to this, this one book, this one resource that was pretty much the definitive source on the Black Death in the Middle East. And so I thought to myself, I have to get this book. It turns out, though, that it's really expensive to get. It usually runs between somewhere between $65 and $80. And I, don't, I, I didn't have the money to spend on that for just one episode, unfortunately. Then, out of the blue, some listener named George, an absolute legend, just he emails me and says, Hey man, I enjoyed the Black Death episode. I want to buy you that book you were talking about. And he did. He sent me the money for the book. I just ordered it. It actually, it actually just arrived a few days ago. I've started reading it. I'm about 30 pages in. It's very dense, but really good. So, first of all, I want to give a huge thanks and shout out to George. What a guy for just giving us more material. Because what this also means is point two, we're going to have a Black Death in the Middle East episode part two. And maybe even a part three, depending on how much information uh, there is in this book. And it seems to be that there's, there's plenty. Anyway, so George, thank you, man. You're awesome. He and I emailed back and forth. Seems like a great guy. And... 
he's going to give us at least one or two more episodes on the Black Death. I don't know when they'll they'll come out. Uh, I still have to read the, the rest of this book, but hopefully in the near future. I'll keep you updated when I'm getting somewhere close to finishing that. Okay, with all that said, I, I think that's about it. So thank you again for listening and stay safe out there. If you want to reach me or follow the show, you can follow the show on Twitter at Podcast Timmer, on Facebook at TimmerPod, or you can email me at any time for any reason. I will get back to you at TimmerPodcast at gmail.com. I will see you on the step next episode right here on the Timmer Podcast. Mm-hmm.